So I'll approach this topic um, more from the perspective of background with a presentation that belongs in the georeferencing section of the training. This is part of the georeferencing courses that we give. There's a background and an idea about how to do the georeferencing more efficiently and why we need to do it more efficiently. And then the follow-on from what I'm showing here is that you will have results that need to go back into the databases from which they came. So the topic is about collaborating and about automating. So what I'm going to talk about are four distinct vertebrate networks that had their sources first with Fishnet without the two and Manus in the year 2001. These were projects funded by the US National Science Foundation to get multiple institutions to work together to put their data online into a single portal. So we're talking about the era in time when GBIF was just beginning to, to define its mission. And these networks were trying to do something quite similar within the scope of, in this case, mammals. Ornus was birds. Herps were uh, reptiles and amphibians. And fish were all the fish, of course. All these networks came into existence sequentially, one after the other. National Science Foundation did not pay for all of them at once at the same time. Each of them, in its, as part of its mission, was to get the data online together so that you could query all the mammals in one spot. The other mission was to improve the quality and usability of the data that were being shared. And the way that that was done is that half of the project was for georeferencing the data sets that were participating. So money to georeference. But the money was limited, and we needed to georeference as much as we could. In the case of Manus, we wanted to georeference every single specimen record that was in the network for 17 collections. So that was something like 1.6 million specimens at that time. And there were no georeferencing guidelines. There was no georeferencing calculator. There was no geolocate. All of those things arose because this project had to figure out how to do it, being the first. It was this project that produced the georeferencing calculator, it produced the guidelines, it produced the, uh, ultimately the manuscript that was published and it produced the rules, some of the rules by which geolocate functions. And geolocate was developed under the Fishnet project in conjunction with the Fitnet, Fishnet project. So these, ha these particular networks have a long history. And that history, today, manifests itself in a combination of all of those networks. If I have a connection, I can show you. So today, I'm being paid under a grant that was meant to bring all of those vertebrate collections together under a single portal and to upgrade the technology to make it much more easy to use and to increase the quality of the data behind it even more. And I'll talk a great deal about the workflow that goes from spreadsheets in museums to here and back again. So in the afternoon I'll talk about a second aspect of repatriation that is different from the one I'm talking about now. And that is repatriation of your opinions back to the collections when you find something wrong. Slightly different repatriation. So back to the history and what happened and why. Here I tried to make a succinct list of the things that you need to know before you start georeferencing. And there are these. How hard is it? I suppose I've convinced you at least 
in its fundamentals that georeferencing is not a simple topic. I've also given you a little bit of evidence that there is hope because there are tools. There's a calculator, there's, there are web services and desktop applications that help you to georeference. So it's something that people do. We, with this class, now we've trained close to 600 students in how to georeference with georeferencing training classes. What methods should you use? You should use the published methods. They're tried, they're proven, they've been used without any particular criticism since the year 2001. So they're solid. And those people who are doing georeferences that are considered of high quality are using those methods. So that's an easy one to answer. What resources should you use? All the resources you can possibly find that help you to get your job done. Use the ones that make your job easy first, like the automated tools. Those won't do everything for you. Then you move on to the next set of tools, which might be online maps or Google. And then you go to the next set, which are your maps. And you start doing things by hand and using a georeferencing calculator. Eventually, to get everything georeferenced, you have to use everything at your disposal. How do you learn? You take a georeferencing course, or as time progresses, Town mentioned that there is a georeferencing.org website. It's being built now, and it is gathering up all of the georeferencing materials that we have had in lots of different places up till now. Manus had its own georeferencing stuff. Herpnet had its own georeferencing stuff. It's scattered right now, and it's all going together on georeferencing.org, including all of the uh, materials that have been presented in the georeferencing workshops over time. So we'll have all those presentations as well. That's how you learn. How long is it going to take you to georeference? That one is a question that's not trivial to answer, but it is possible to get a reasonable estimate. And the reason it's possible to get a reasonable estimate is because some people have done it in the past and kept track of how hard it was to do in terms of time, time per specimen, let's say. Time per locality in reality, but that can be translated into time per specimen. And since time is money, you can turn time into the cost of georeferencing. So now, I'll try to show you some of the things that help you to answer those questions. This is the one, this GeoRef guide, the one we were just looking at that had the examples for the georeferencing calculator. That's this document. That's the source of all of the theory. <coughs> That's where the methods are. Those are the methods want, you want to use because those methods help you to make reproducible results and well-documented results so that others know whether they should use your georeference or not. Now I want to talk about collaborations. This was perhaps one of the most innovative parts of these collaborative projects with multiple institutions. And it was a way to be efficient about georeferencing. And the way it worked was that we had students, in most cases, at institutions throughout the world throughout the United States in our case, because we could only pay students in the United States. We had others outside of the United States who helped to do georeferencing as well. So we had labs, competitive labs, of georeferencers. Each of them who had already been trained in the methods, and each of them assigned to do a particular country. So one institution might have georeferenced everything for Madagascar, for all 17 institutions. Put all of Madagascar together and let one team georeference it. And the team that georeferences Madagascar is the team that knows most about Madagascar. They have collectors who go there. They have maps. They have all the resources needed to do Madagascar better than anybody else who's participating. But they do it for everyone. And that's repeated <coughs> for every country in the world. 
When they're done, they do the georeferencing for that country and they send it back to a central location called John. And John puts all of that back together into a big database and checks it to, that they did it right and sends the resulting information back to the 17 institutions who are participating. So they sent their raw data, we sent them georeferences with their raw data. Then it was their job to get those data back into the databases. The interesting part of that whole process is everybody loved to participate in everything up to the point of putting it back into their own databases. Many did. Many were quite enthusiastic to do so and did so. Many were quite enthusiastic to do so and didn't do so. And many didn't really seem to care. So the repatriation problem is a serious one. All this work was done. In this case, it was done for some institutions for free. And they still didn't put it in their databases. But the reasons were complicated in some cases and simple in others. The simple case was they didn't know how. They had never had John's famous access database training course. So they didn't know how to take georeferences and add them to their own database. The lesson there is that in a big broad scale collaboration like this, you need to have all the steps in place if you want to achieve the impact that you want. And in none of these projects was that last step in place. So that last step is now being covered by VertNet since it's the umbrella for all of those collections that were in those original projects. And under VertNet, we're actually helping them to connect those georeferences again with the specimen records that they should be connected to. And the result will be more high quality data will be available via VertNet for work that was already been done. So just a little bit of information that helps you to figure out the last question on the slide, which is how long is it going to take? The information about how long it's going to take is based on having kept track of these large scale collaborations. So here are the data for Manus. Here's a map where every red dot is a distinct locality that was georeferenced in Manus. And let's look at the scale. There were 326,000 localities georeferenced in that project over the whole world. Those are 326,000 dots for 1.4 million specimens. That already tells me something interesting. That tells me that there were about five specimens per locality for mammals. So if mammal collections are created equal across the planet, that may or may not be true, but it's a good starting point. It means if you have a mammal collection, there are probably about five mammals per locality. So you count your specimens, and that tells you how many localities will have to be georeferenced. We've done this with other vertebrate communities, and the number varies. For mammals, it's about six. For birds, it's about six. For amphibians and reptiles, it's about 10. And for fish, I don't know the answer. The other thing that's interesting is that we kept track of how long or how much time was spent to do the georeferencing using the methods that you've been shown, the point radius method. And under Manus, the average was 14 localities per hour. That's pretty fast, actually. And that's using a georeferencing calculator and maps and Google. This is before Google Earth and before Google Maps were both readily usable for the georeferencing process. Before Geolocate, before BioGeomancer. So this was the hard way. And we were able to achieve 14 localities per hour. But that 14 is the mean. It depended heavily on where you were georeferencing. We have the information about how long it took for different countries. The two worst case scenarios under Manus were China and Russia. And it wasn't because 
nobody spoke Chinese or nobody spoke Russian. It was because the localities had undergone an interpretation by a collector who didn't speak Chinese or who didn't speak Russian, and they didn't look like either of those languages anymore. And the resources to find locations in both of those countries are difficult to find. So even with Ru native Russian speakers, it was difficult to georeference Russia for those reasons. So for those two countries, the localities per hour was three and not 14. In the best case scenario, the highest number of localities per hour were, was for one data set in the state of Idaho in the United States, in which the georeferencer was able to achieve 41 localities per hour. And the reason for that was he created an Excel spreadsheet where he cheated. He decided he could do something semi-automated. So he set up a spreadsheet with some formulas and all he needed to do was say, this one is north, this one's northeast, this one's southeast, and it's six miles, 14 miles, 17 miles. And then he would put the place name and he would determine the distinct place names in Idaho and he would georeference the distinct na place names in Idaho to get the extents. He had an extent column and he put extent for every town in there. It helps that Idaho only has about four place names. Hey, that's our neighbor you're talking about. Good thing we didn't bring up Montana. Huh? <laughs> Montana has about four people in it and two of them are here. So. The point is that the, nut, the rate for georeferencing varies geographically as well. But we have good numbers, good enough numbers for you to be able to estimate how long the georeferencing process will take. For, for Manus, with those 326,000 localities, we had 40 georeferencers working, more or less, for a period of three years to get that accomplished. Gives you an example of the scale of that collaboration, which was big. <laughs> 